Everybody and welcome to the True Crime Squad. This is Katie Weaver here with my sister, co-host and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Oh, it's going very well. Wonderful. Had a fun day. Well, wow. I was working today and I came across these little cuties. Look at these pigs. <gasps> oh, they're Kuna Kunas. Aren't they cute? They have they're the longest so hair. Cute. And they're black and orange. Yeah, the people I was delivering to actually had this pen kind of like right in their front yard. Oh, my gosh. And they were they so are the cute. nicest pigs, too. Oh, they're uh, They were so curious and friendly, just mm -hmm. watching me and winking and snorting at me while I was delivering their package. I thought they were so cute. They so that that's one of my favorite hair. things is coming across. They do have really long hair. Uh, I they, love them. They're like oh, one so step cute. up from Juliana's. They're one step bigger than Juliana's. Oh, okay. And in fact, a lot of people have a Juliana that's crossed with a Kuna Kuna, but that's a pretty big pig. Uh -huh. um, oh, man, they're so cute. Oh, they are. That hair was just killing me. There's a variety of pig in Canada that are like Kuna Kuna adjacent that mm -hmm. have curly hair like sheep. Oh, I have so seen them. They look them. a lot like that, but their hair is curly. And my God, mm -hmm. they're adorable. I have seen them. They are so cute. Mm -hmm. Well, I love getting pictures of people's cute pets and livestock and stuff. So I thought well, those I were kind of am in love. Book. How fun. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Can you imagine how much trouble those pigs cause? I'm pretty sure they're not sleeping on the couch, though. Uh, no, they appear to be outdoor pigs. Although <laughs> their pen is very close to the house. <laughs> I was like, these guys are really close to the house. Really close Maybe to the Maybe on cold house. winter's nights. Uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? I doubt it. But <laughs> well, I love it. Well, I have a picture too. Ooh. These guys just posed way too cute to not share. Oh, look at the boys. Aren't they sweet? They're cute. These are my boys. So that's Rico on the left and Bruno in the middle and Luca on the right. <laughs> um, they were staring at a, Mars's Dorito. <laughs> was that what was happening? That's how we got yeah. this great shot. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. they don't usually all hold still at the same time like that. I know. That's a rare but event. For food. I have a picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bruno is the most food motivated dog I have ever had. And that's saying oh, a lot. He? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's as bad as the pigs. He will do anything for food. Anything. Which is good because he doesn't mind otherwise. So. <laughs> 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 we get him to somehow, right? We need something. Yeah. Well, I went with Scott today on some inspections, some home inspections. And then we drove uh, up into the place that we're going to camp for the fourth. Just yeah. to see. It's always, these are, we always camp in places that are just public land. We don't like to camp in campgrounds, like where you have to be around oh. other people and no. no. And we all have campers and bathrooms and stuff. So it's not like we have to stay in a campground, right? Mm -hmm. Uh but the, the thought of camping near other people is such a hard pass for me. <laughs> yeah. I don't want their dogs bothering us. I don't want my dogs no, bothering them. Like, I do the not want thing. any trouble. Yeah. It's all about the dogs. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And the noise. Because we're noisy. We have to run a generator at night. Like, we're just, we're a pain in the ass. No one wants to We laugh really us. loud. You know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. We're, we're annoying and we know it. That's why we keep to ourselves. We get mm -hmm. it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so... On holiday weekends, like when you're going to camp and there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of people out, we're always out scoping out our favorite spots and getting one of our campers yeah. pulled into it ASAP. Right. So we get a the spot. Spot we usually camp in over uh, the fourth. Last year, we had a little dust up. And this has never <laughs> happened before. We have camped in this spot for the fourth of July for probably 10 years. Yeah. Last year, I, mean, I always pull my camper out there a few days early to make sure that we hold that spot. Well, last year, some people camped there too, and it's not a very big place, but they really crammed themselves in there with a whole bunch of tents and people. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon the sheriff rolls up to talk to them, talks to yeah. them for a while and then leaves. And my brother-in-law kind of stopped him on their way out and he's like, hey, uh, everything okay? And they're like, well, 
they seem to think that this is private property and that they had permission to camp here and that you guys didn't. And they were asking us <laughs> to kick you out. And my brother-in-law's like, oh, isn't this an access? And he's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's it's like, it's not. Yeah, he's like, this is county land. He's like, you are more than welcome to stay. He's like, but if you have any trouble with them, let us know. Whew. We stayed. They stayed. There were some sound issues, uh, not from us, from them. But otherwise, we just tried to ignore them and keep the peace, you know. But, you know, they did several, like, kind of passive aggressive things with parking and sound mm -hmm. and, and out on their motorcycles and stuff to be difficult. Mm -hmm. But we just chose to, we're going to ignore you. We're not going to have any trouble. But that was yeah. pretty funny. Call the sheriff to have us kicked out of a off public land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah, our were. friends said they own this and so we can camp here. You're like, well, who are your friends? Are they the Madison County commissioners? Because right. Like, bad news, babe. We own this too. It's public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, that was interesting. They're not even, we looked at their license plates and they weren't even from Madison County. And um, Or I even am. a close county. They were quite yeah. a ways away. Right. They were just I, in the wrong place, I think. They just probably. didn't know where the hell they were supposed to like, be. Bro, I actually place. do pay taxes here. <laughs> you know, but that was right. crazy. So this year, I think just to one up us, uh, somebody has that like six tents there that have been there for about eight days, which is illegal, but whatever. Like, I'm not going to do the sheriff thing and all that shit. I'm just not. So no. we're going back to a spot that we typically camp in the fall that we love. So we went and checked it out today. Wide open. We shouldn't have any trouble at all. Hopefully we'll get our camper over there tomorrow and there won't be anyone there. And yay. Yeah. Yay. Can't wait. Oh, it's gorgeous. The, uh, we have uh, to get the hell out of town for the 4th of July. Get our dogs out of here. Yeah. The uh, wild roses are just starting to bloom up there. The river's coming down, so it's not so, the water's not so high and yucky. Oh, it's not going to be crazy hot. I'm so excited. It's going to be great. Yeah. It is. I'm excited too. Yeah. So, so that's how I spent my day. Well, in crafting, I burned the hell out of my finger on a, I was sublimating a, keychains and that's a process of you you heat the product up to 350 degrees for 60 seconds and well as it mm. turns out when they have a metal component and you touch it oh ow yeah so i had had a pep talk with myself now don't <laughs> be careful that those metal pieces are gonna be really hot and i immediately reached out and touched one of them just instantly <laughs> I'm like the kid. I'm like the person talk. who says, don't touch the stove because it's hot. So you run right over and touch it. That's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's apparently who I am now. Yeah. <laughs> but That's funny. Anyway, a little lavender oil and I will probably live through it. But I imagine so. Luckily, it's my left thumb. So it's not my scrolling thumb. So typing, oh. texting thumb. So <laughs> <laughs> crisis averted. <laughs> Well, we've got uh, a full episode for you. This is our Tuesday episode and there's lots going on. But Christy, I'm going to kick it over to you to uh, break things uh, forward with, oh gosh, a Florida man. Oh, yes. Friends, why do we live in such a trigger happy society? This, what? It's okay. getting worse and worse. Right. Yes. It is. Ridiculous. So, recently, there was a situation where people, these people were kind of headed, you know, in for the night. It was around 9, 9.30 at night. And they uh, noticed a man in their backyard whom they apparently didn't remember was their pool cleaner who was supposed to be there, but he was late. Oh. And so uh, the man in this situation, Bradley Hosever, sees someone in the backyard. This happened on June 15th. And they see an unknown male figure on their pool deck. Except they should have known him because he was their pool guy. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. So what does Bradley do? Does he open the door and say, hey, what are you doing? Does he call 911? No, he does not. He gets does out he his AR-15. Does look equipment by any chance? Right. No, he doesn't do any of the rational, normal person kind of things to do, like watch for a minute, call the police, lock all the doors. No. 
He goes and he gets his AR-15 because, as you do these days, and poor Carl Pollock, who was the pool cleaner, was just out there trying to do his job. He didn't knock on the door and tell him he was there or call and say he was coming late. Okay. However, if there's a guy wandering around your pool on the day that they come to maintenance your pool, I mean, just a little critical thinking might give you a clue, just a clue or two. Just a clue. So he fired two shots at Pollock through uh, a glass door. Boy, that's becoming quite the theme, too. Uh, right? What the hell? So, of course, uh, you know, what does the pool guy do? Uh, he turns and runs because sure. who wouldn't? He was hit with glass and shrapnel from the rounds. He wasn't directly shot, but he was injured. Hmm. Well, then, um, genius Hosevar uh, continues to fire, believing that he was still on the property. You know, he's running away. Mm-hmm. All they ever saw him in have in his hand was a flashlight. Ugh. Um, so he fired at him about thirty times total <sighs> in a ninety second period. Holy shit! Right, because this is what a rational adult human does mm. when handling a situation like this, right? This, wrong oh my this god this is the problem with the good guy with the gun theory these right. guys think they're the good guys that keep doing stuff like this but they're, he's they're not out into the night 30 rounds yeah. out of that gun oh my god so apparently they figure out what's happened and poor pool guy goes to the hospital with some minor injuries oh. fortunately um fortunately old holtzbar is uh Let's just say a real bad shot because this guy could have so easily been dead. Oh, it's a miracle. I mean, considering how many of these we've heard recently where people were killed. Yeah. Police are calling this an unfortunate set of circumstances. But due to Florida's stand your ground law, Hosevar will not be charged. What? He should never be allowed to have a gun again. Right? He fired two rounds at him, so he turned and ran away. Yeah. So then he's allowed to shoot a man in the back who's running away. Clearly not a threat, right? Wow. Ugh. Not only that, in a neighborhood like that, just firing 30 rounds. Right. It's a miracle. No one else was injured. I know, right? Those those bullets are just a flying. Oh my God. The police say, but uh it's it's lawful, but it's just an awful set of circumstances. Lawful, my ass. An awful set of circumstances? Yeah, for the pool guy. Yeah, but we're fortunate that no one was seriously hurt. There was no crime that was committed, and Hosevar was acting within the law when he fired. I cannot understand why the second time he started firing that that was legal. The two first shots, fine. The guy turns and runs. They think they still hear him on the property. I don't know, probably desperately trying to get their damn gate open to get the hell out of there. Right. And then he thinks it's okay to fire a whole bunch more? Oh, my God. What the hell? The the pool guy never did anything threatening. He was walking around their pool, in their pool area, with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. And he was, in fact, someone who was hired to be there. To be there. Just oh, sense. Jesus. Damn, I'm sick of these cases. At least in this case, the pool guy lived, fortunately. But that idiot shouldn't be allowed to own that gun. Talk about a reactive mm-hmm. response. But My God. I just, you know, for, for the pro-gun crowd, and I'm not the anti-gun crowd or the pro-gun crowd. I'm the let's not be idiots with guns crowd. But right. if you're serious about not wanting your gun rights to be taken away. You should be serious about not allowing this shit because right. these are the things. These are the things that just this keep is, compounding. Yeah. This is the stuff that makes you go, what the hell is that guy doing owning that gun? If that's how reactive he is. Yeah. He's danger. He's dangerous. Mm-hmm. And pool guy Very never did dangerous. anything and never, never actually posed a threat to them at all. Well, and just because they're not going to prosecute him, you know, just because there's not going to (coughs) be criminal charges doesn't mean that there won't be some civil 
I think pool guy should sue limb shit out of them because he was hired to be there and he may have been late, but he was supposed to be there. He was there trying to do his job. I would think he'd, I would think he would. I can't imagine there won't be lawyers lining up around the block to take that case. I'm wow. Weak. I'm just so glad the pool guy's okay. Yes. Out yeah, of all of this. But this is nuts. It's gone differently. And we've heard how many times recently, times when it did not. So, yeah. yeah I, I will admit, as an Amazon delivery driver, I bought pepper spray. Oh, I'm yeah, wearing it on my lanyard now. Of course. Because you just yeah. do not know how bizarre people are so terrified mm -hmm. and of what i don't know of people what are, of the boogeyman honestly They're, at this point right right but people There's are so, so muffed up right now happening. yeah yeah it's terrifying and mostly i have it in case like a a mean dog you know that i can't get back to my car or something yeah but yeah, yeah i'm wearing it on my lanyard now because i'm like jesus i don't know what to think about this world and i'm not yeah. gonna pack a gun that's ridiculous but Apparently, some people are, in fact, very ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, that, of course, happened in Florida because, of course, it did. Yeah. Yikes. Well, I'm going to kick the mic back to you for our main case. Okay. Which is, as I heard here, a DNA for the win. A winny win. Yes. Mm. This also could have been a Florida man, actually. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> is it Florida Day? I don't not quite. Know. Not quite. We almost got there. My last case is not a Florida case. All right. Well, this mystery juice that you find in the bottom of your trash can that's been sitting outside all summer. Yikes. Is Joseph Zeeler. And Joseph is oh, quite the piece of work. He appears to be. Joseph was sentenced to death. On Monday in oh a double murder uh, sexual assault case. I want to tell you a little bit about that case and about his behavior in court because, wow, <coughs> this, well, he is something. So this took place in Cape Coral, Florida. So in 1990, uh, a mom named Jan, Jan Cornell, went to stay at her boyfriend's house overnight and she left her daughter this is robin she was 11 with her friend lisa who had just finished moving in to rent a room from jan and Lee and robin that very day they had decided oh, to all be roommates. it was going to be a really good situation they were very dear friends this was going to be a good thing it was going to be a, a really a fresh start for uh lisa and she really needed it so she had decided to go spend the night with her boyfriend and you know uh lisa was like yeah go we're good we're gonna go to bed all all is well so she did and she came home about 4 30 in the morning she got really nervous uh and off-centered about being gone from her daughter and decided that uh she needed to come home so she came mm -hmm. home but uh, didn't have her keys and knocked and knocked on the front door and nobody answered. But she heard footsteps on the stairs. So she thought, oh, someone's coming down to answer the door. Mm -hmm. never came. So she's like, well, that is just weird. So she went around the back of the house and the sliding glass door was open. Oh, no. And it should not have been. So she walked in the house and <laughs> she discovered uh, an ironing board, like the kind that folds down from the wall. Mm -hmm. Open with a bunch of pictures of her 11 year old daughter on it, which was very weird. Mm. So she ran upstairs to her bedroom and discovered poor little Robin naked, dead, bloody, oh. with oh. a foreign sex toy laying not very far from her. Oh, God. She turned her over and started CPR. She called 911. Then, of course, uh, even though uh, it was futile, she'd been dead a while. And then uh, ran into Lisa's room and discovered that she, too, was deceased. So, of course, the police came, um, uh, did all of the things. But this was 1990. And so uh, forensics were not terrible at that time, but they weren't nearly as good as they are now. Mm -hmm. um, they did find semen on the sheet that little Robin was laying on. 
and mm -hmm. some other uh, DNA evidence that they held on to. And at the time, she really wanted to cremate Robin, and the police said, don't do it. You never know if we'll need another look at this body. So she had her uh, plate. She couldn't stand the thought of burying her, putting her underground. She just wanted to cremate her so she could have her ashes and have her close to her. But so she yeah. ended up putting her in a crypt, actually. Oh, wow. So they interviewed, they had a lot of leads. They interviewed a lot of people. There had been about six different people in the house that day helping Lisa move in. But nothing ever uh, came from it. Mm -hmm. So, finally, in, I believe, 2020, they finally told her, uh, basically, this is a cold case now. We have everything we need. There's really nothing else we could gain from uh, for Robin's body. And they actually allowed her to uh, exhume her at that point and cremate her like she would wanted to. So, she'd had that little piece of, uh, of closure, but, you know, that's not much. No. Well, in 2016, well, so back it up to 1999, they took uh, the DNA evidence and put it in the system. And it didn't match anybody, but they put it in CODIS, so they had it. In 2016, a man named Joseph Zeller, guy in his 50s, got in a fight with his son and shot him with a pellet gun and mm -hmm. caught a charge and was convicted of aggravated assault and his DNA got put into the system. Yeah. And guess who it came? Oh, wow. So he was arrested and he told police and in the interrogation room that he had been in a motorcycle accident in 1998 and didn't really remember anything that happened before that. Uh, besides talking in circles, being super belligerent and just being as unhelpful as possible. So, okay, fine. Well, it has taken from 2016 until now to get this case to trial, which is insane. That is insane. Why so long? I don't really understand why. I tried to get more information on that and couldn't really find anything. But uh, it, he's finally been to trial. He has been an absolute horse's ass at trial. Mm -hmm. He has been, well, after he was arrested, he wrote three threatening letters to Jan. Oh, my God. With physical consequences if she didn't find a way to get these charges dropped. Oh, my hell. So he's facing some uh, charges besides all of this that he's already got for uh, trying to tamper with a victim or a witness. Yeah. What a creep. He's been awful. So mm. in court during the trial, he was very belligerent. Uh, Jan said she felt like every day he was spending his entire day trying to intimidate her, leering at her, staring at her. And she's a oh. badass, man. She just stared right back at him. Good he was like, her. yeah, you're not doing it, bro. So, cool. yeah. Yeah, she's like, that's absolutely not happening. So, she stood her ground, and good for Jan. He actually took the stand to mostly be an ass and talk nonsense. But on the stand, he tried to claim that the reason his DNA was found in that apartment was because he had had sex with Jan about three months before that. <gasps> oh, gross. It was in a long-term relationship. And also, had never met him before, and he was just taunting her and being cruel to her. Oh he God. said, all this case tells him is that she's a pig who doesn't wash her sheets. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. This guy should never have been on the street for any amount of time ever. No, he is really something. So then they, so he was found guilty and the jury recommended the death penalty. And Good. so that it triggered a hearing for the judge to meet out the final sentence. And basically his job was, you know, that was with all of the, uh, all the stuff, you know, that they want in sentencing, particularly death penalty. Right. Right, all the stuff. So he was in court on Monday for the final sentencing. 
after the jury's recommendation. And before court started, he called his lawyer over uh, and acted like he wanted to talk to him maybe where the microphone couldn't hear him. So his lawyer went over, and this is what happened. What's that? So for those listening and not watching, he elbowed him as hard as he could in the face. He was shackled, yeah. but he was able to get a pretty good elbow up there and took a shot. Now the lawyer sits down and the judge says, are you okay? And he says, I was a boxer. I've taken a lot better shots than that. <laughs> well, he is kind of a buff looking guy, like with a he big is. thick neck and stuff. So he didn't look like yeah. he that would hurt him too much. But my God. But in your face, Zealer, jackass. So yeah. he was. Enjoy him. hell. Mm -hmm. So immediately three bailiffs were on him and wrestled him to the ground. And they removed him from the courtroom for a few minutes just to kind of get order back and to make sure that the attorney was okay. And he was like, I'm fine. Let's go. But, uh, and then they brought him back in uh, much more shackled, you know, so that he couldn't pull another one of those. The other thing he did in court is, and I have a picture, but it's a little hard to see, but I'll try to show you. He wrote killer in marker on his dentures. Oh. And kept yeah, smiling did. and flashing that at the judge. Well, what? he's definitely not going to get the death penalty now, is he? Right? No. And then uh, when he did testify on the stand, he also did this. I didn't blur that out. Someone else did. But uh, he flipped off the jury. Yeah, dude, you're, yeah, way to go. Way to show them, buddy. Way to show them. Also, Joseph, I think the haircut convicts you alone, but that's just me. Uh, Yeah, what the hell is going on with that? Very weird hair, right? Anyway, right. maybe not, maybe not. But... He's combing it all forward, trying to cover mm -hmm. the fact I that he's bald on top, except he's not bald. Working. Yeah. Well, honey, now you're going into prison, and they will shave that crazy head of yours. But anyway, so after all that, the judge said that he doesn't feel like he really deserves to be on this planet anymore. So he did uphold the death penalty in that case. So I'm sure he'll have a thousand appeals now, but uh, he has now been sentenced with the death penalty. So I mean, at least he's not out there in the world hurting other people. Yeah. So, oh so much love to Jan. Jan, you are a straight up badass. The way she handled yeah. herself in court. And she's had a hot minute here before, since uh, the time that her daughter and her best friend were murdered. But still, she was tough as hell uh, in the face of his evil and the threats mm -hmm. he'd already made to her and the things that he's done to destroy her family. And she was tough. And his attorneys were very hard on her, too. Mm -hmm. Very hard on her. Really mm -hmm. tried to make her out to look like a horrible mother and you know my god so like what i mean this guy raped right. and murdered her daughter like what Ugh. Right. yeah what yep loser very gross but anyway joseph have the day you deserve definitely enjoy hell jackass yeah so i'm gonna kick the mic back over to you for our last uh bit of today which is a true crime update yes <laughs> Well, apparently there are a lot of evil people going away right now. Oh. And this is what we like to hear. So the shooter in the Colorado Springs nightclub from November of last year has pled guilty and been sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Excellent. Excellent, this was right? From Club Q, right? Club Q, yep, in Colorado Springs. This happened in November of 2022. And he has pled guilty to murder and no contest to several other charges. This is Anderson Lee Aldrich. Um, he's also charged with um, attempted murder, 46 counts of attempted murder. 
Mm-hmm. And um, he also pled no contest to two hate crimes, one felony and another misdemeanor. Good. And he will go away forever. And that is until the feds get a hold of him. Yeah. Because they are considering uh, federal hate cr- crime charges against him as well. Uh-huh. The only good thing I can say about this is that the families and survivors do not have to live through a horrible trial with this person. Yep. He has expressed some remorse. He and he has been willing to take responsibility for himself, which I think doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Uh, I really find it um, kind of shocking that they don't usually do this. Yeah. So the victims in this case were Daniel Aston, Kelly Loving, Derek Rump, Ashley Paw, and Raymond Green Vance. Mm -hmm. And then he fired at 46 other people, several of whom were injured. Right. Um, He actually showed some emotion while the family members spoke and gave their victim impact statements. Mm -hmm. He said to the judge, I intentionally and after deliberation caused the death of each victim. Wow. He has apparently been told, been reaching out to the Associated Press, um, talking about uh, expressing remorse Mm -hmm. and his intention to face consequences for what he's done. I hope that some reporters make a very good effort to get to know him and Mm -hmm. get to understand what was in his head, what fueled this, where this came from. If I mean, there may not ever be a good reason. Of course there won't. There's never going to be a good reason, but to at least understand what propelled him to do something like this. It might be a rare event to get to do that because most of these guys go down. He may actually be willing. Yeah. The fact that he pled guilty, thank God for the families that they didn't have to go through some long drawn out bullshit trial. Right. That he actually just pled guilty. Thank God. Yeah. Well, you know, and this is one of those cases where the year before this happened, Mm -hmm. he was arrested for threatening his grandparents and vowing to become the next mass killer. Oh, God. Right. And they did not pursue charges against him at that time. Sure. And I think, how many times have we seen this in one of these shooting cases? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, this shooter got their guns back after that incident. Because grandma and grandpa never in a million years thought he would actually do such a thing. Because yeah. we never think somebody will actually do such a thing until right. they do it. And then we go, well, I just can't believe it. He was such a good kid. Except for the time that this and this and this and this and this and this happened. Other than that, they were wonderful. You know, it's like it's, right. the story never changes. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't. And there was a there was potential to divert this at that point, And that did not happen. Um, you know, because part of it is that our laws have not caught up. The police didn't really have grounds to keep his guns. Yep. Um, and they have to have legal standing to do that. Sure. And we didn't have that. Grandma and grandpa have would have had to have pressed charges. Yeah. Right. Well, and also we need some changes in laws when it comes to, um, potential mass shooters. Yep. You know, we do. Mm-hmm. We need some help there. I wonder if what there needs to be, this is a total spitball here, but mm-hmm. maybe there needs to be something in the DSM, you know, mm-hmm. that is some kind of a, a diagnosis that a specially trained psychiatrist or psychologist could make after looking at lots of evidence, charges, in, interviewing family members, like a really intelligent deep dive into this person. And if they find this person to be someone who is, uh, you know, deemed to be unsafe, that they would be able to make that recommendation. I know that Mm -hmm. kind of scares the crap out of people, but. But we we need something. Yeah. Right. We need something because you could see the risk there. And yet there was, I mean, he literally made the threat. Yeah. But then there wasn't anything they could do. 
Right. And the police can only do what the law allows them to do, you know. Yeah. But we can all sit back constantly and, and make judgments on, well, they should have done or they should have done this. Well, grandma and grandpa didn't press charges. And even if they did, maybe he wouldn't have even got a felony. And if he didn't, then the guns right. would have been returned to him anyway. Right. And uh, Aldrich has claimed to be non-binary and is going by they, them pronouns now. Uh, we don't know if that's real or if that's an attempt to mitigate the idea that this is a hate crime. Right. I don't really feel very trusting of that, honestly. But um, Aldrich has said that they were on a very large plethora of drugs and abusing steroids at the time that this attack happened. Oh. Um. Aldridge has never said if this was hate motivated. I mean, it pretty obviously was. He shot up a gay club. Right. And so um, people like victims and families of victims and stuff are concerned that some of the things he's done by talking to the Associated Press and some mm -hmm. of the things that he's done are to try to avoid the death penalty in the federal system. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, Colorado abolished the death penalty in 2020. Mm -hmm. So life without prison is is life his mandated control. sentence. Yeah. Yeah. You said yeah, life without life prison. <laughs> no, life with prison, life in prison. Yeah. But they have been very unwilling to say what their motive was. And we, you know, that does make me very suspicious. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad so they it's good news. I, I'm glad for the the outcome. Family doesn't have to go through that. You know, the community doesn't have mm -hmm. to go through that now. And bring on the federal hate crime charges, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. No has to that. happen. Yep. Well, good. Yeah. All righty. Well, this is Tuesday. We'll be back Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Mountain for a Wednesday night case updates. And there's a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Poe Berger was in court today. Yeah. Uh, dare I say it was a nothing burger? It was, but yeah. mostly there were a couple of gems, but it, it wasn't a lot, but he was in court. So we'll be, uh, we'll bring you that and everything else that's gone on here in this last week. So including some nonsense with Corey Richens and well, lots of other yeah. shitty people. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's what's up. <laughs> bring you the shitty people update. <laughs> it's true. All righty. Well, guys, that's what we've got. Please take good care of yourselves. Have a glass of wine, have a cookie. Do what you need to do to take care of you. Nobody else is going to. It's up to you. Yes. And you get to. This has been yet another production of the True Crime Squad. Take care. Bye, everybody.